Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This presentation is, covers the use of enzymes in the pulp and paper industry. Enzymes are uh, something that have been studied for a long time, but only recently have uh, come to be utilized very much in the paper industry. And uh, my name is Phil Hookstra from Buckman Laboratories. Buckman is based in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'll give you some information on Buckman in a second here. Um, the presentation is called Enzymes at Work, an introduction to the pulp and paper industry, Intr introduction to enzyme technologies in the pulp and paper industry. And um, let me just give you a little bit of information on Buckman Laboratories. Buckman Laboratories is a worldwide uh, specialty chemical producer with the international headquarters in Memphis, Tennessee. We just uh, celebrated our 60-year anniversary. Buckman was established in 1945 and now operates in over 90 countries around the world, providing many different chemistries for the pulp and paper industry. Um, our focus when we began was primarily microbiology. Back in 1945, there was no way to control slime problems, and that's how original Dr. Stanley Buckman started this company. Ever since then, we've been dedicated to the principle of discovering and implementing, implementing uh, creative solutions to customer problems in the pulp and paper industry. So Buckman is a family-owned company operating around the world. Uh, it's a private corporation with a focus, uh, a long-term focus and a plan to remain private as well. Uh, here are our locations around the world. Here's where we have manufacturing locations, two in the United States. You can see the other locations around the world with our latest one uh, in Shanghai, China. In addition, we have technical uh, laboratories in all those locations as well. Here's the outline for uh, today's presentation. We'll just do a general introduction and some basic information on enzymes, what sort of functions they have, what effects, how well they work, give you just a little bit of information on everyday uses of enzymes. Then we'll talk a little bit about industrial production and then we'll get to what we're primarily interested in, uses of enzymes in the pulp and paper industry. So we'll look at uh, a number of different topics. We'll look at a number of different diagrams and hopefully at the end of this you'll be able to explain how enzymes work and what possibly they may be able to do for you in the pulp and paper industry. Um, okay, so some basic information on enzymes. Each living cell contains thousands of different kinds of enzymes, and really enzymes are the molecules of life. Uh, even as you, wa as you look, uh, watch and as you hear, um, as your body metabolism occurs, all of that, um, all of those uh, things necessary for living and functioning are done by enzymes. So they're essential to life in all living things. Enzymes catalyze all the activities of life, and we'll come back to that term. And interesting that enzymes can be isolated for study and use, and of course that's the whole reason that um, we're using these in the pulp and paper industry. But enzymes are not living things. That's sort of a common misconception. Um, now maybe we should take a minute or two to, look, to define the, word, the term catalyze. Um, a, a catalyst is a, uh, something that reduces the en energy barrier for reaction. Any reaction, chemical reaction that occurs takes an input of energy, or many of them do, and a catalyst is one that uh, facilitates that reaction. But it's not used up in the process. It's not really a part of the reactants. It's not a part of the products. Let's give for an example an everyday thing a catalytic converting, for converter used in an automobile uh, to reduce air pollution, reduces nitrogen oxides to nitrogen and oxidizes carbon monoxide to uh, more innocuous carbon dioxide. What happens in a catalytic converter is that uh, there are metal catalysts, platinum and other sorts of things that accelerate these reactions and so what you get is efficient oxidation of those fuel byproducts at fairly mild conditions. It'd be difficult in, uh, you know, a 
more severe operation to uh, completely eliminate those materials, to oxidize them completely to uh, innocuous materials, but that's done easily. Well, as a matter of fact, you get reduction and oxidation in the same small piece of equipment. So those aren't enzymes, but those give you an example of what kind of uh, work enzymes do. They catalyze the reaction. Here's a, a diagram if you've ever taken an int introductory chemistry course. Uh, you'll see this diagram where you begin with the reactants and on the y-axis is the free energy. In this case you have to input energy to get this reaction to occur. You have to add energy and to get it over that uh, uh, hump and get the products produced. So there's the energy barrier for that reaction. Now with the use of a, cat a catalyst you can produce the same products but it takes in this case just half as much energy. So that is the de that's the definition we're going to use for a catalyst, something that facilitates a reaction. So enzymes are catalysts for the biochemistry of life. They allow complex reactions, very complex reactions, to occur in a living cell at reasonable conditions of temperature, pH, and pressure, and with precision control. So um, an enzyme will do things under very reasonable conditions or mild conditions that it's almost impossible to do even in a chemical laboratory. And we can define enzymes further to say that they are pr polymers of amino acids. In fact, in living things, primarily 20 amino acids are used as building blocks for proteins. The shape and other properties of each protein is dictated by the precise sequence of amino acids that are found in that protein. Let me just give you an example of uh, some amino acids that are used. Well, before we get to that, we can define proteins more accurately as ma macromolecules. By that we mean uh, several, maybe several thousand atoms in a, in a macromolecule. Proteins are not small, simple molecules like water or carbon dioxide. And typically, they're made up of 200 to 500 amino acids, although they can be smaller than that, obviously, and they can be much larger than that. There's a great variation in molecular weight, even up to a chain of 27,000 amino acids. As a matter of fact, titan, a protein found in skeletal and cardiac muscle, is constructed from 26,926 amino acid monomers, not 925 or 927, but it's uh, constructed very carefully of that particular amount. That's a huge protein and most of the proteins we deal with, um, the enzymes we deal with are just are much smaller than that. Here's the examples of some amino acids that are used to make a protein. There's a total of 20. We just show three of them here. You can see that in each case they have a carboxylic acid group and then an amino group, hence the, the amino acid name that is used. And then you can see there's a in each case, a uh, group of atoms on the side chain connected to the carbon that holds the, the amino group, and these can vary a lot. Uh, and some of these will have a cationic charge, some have an anionic charge, and the characteristics of these side chains are, are crucial in the building of an enzyme. All right, here, and let's show the formation of a protein is in sort of a simulated case here from amino acids. The nitrogen of one at, uh, attaches to the, ca the carbon, carbonyl carbon of the other, and the same thing happens, and you lose a couple molecules of water, and what we end up with is uh, a protein, okay? And it just has three amino acids along the chain, but you can see every protein is a chain much longer than this, of course, but of a, a repeating uh, sequence of carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen in the backbone. And of course, this doesn't happen willy-nilly. It happens very in, uh, under controlled conditions, and that any of those reactions are catalyzed by a particular enzyme as well. So the formation of enzymes is, form is catalyzed by enzymes too. So for uh, the structure of enzymes is much more complex than the molecular structure we just looked at, and, and it's defined in several different ways. First, there's an amino acid sequence, like we looked at. That would be termed the primary structure. 
There's a secondary structure, which is the spatial relationships of groups of amino acids. They may be arranged in pleated sheets or in alpha helices in different parts of a protein. You'll see some structures later that you might recognize some of those. And then that, that, those groups and, that, and the sequence of amino acids are put together in a three-dimensional way that is crucial to the functioning of the enzyme. And so that's called the tertiary structure. And then there may be one or more of these tertiary structures uh, put together, and that would be termed the quaternary structure. I'll show a slide here real quick that gives you an example of that. The primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. They may be then uh, associated with each other in such a way to form an alpha helix. That helix may be part of uh, a polypeptide chain that has a certain precise three-dimensional structure. And then two or more of those may poly polypeptide chains may be put together in the quaternary structure of the enzyme. We can summarize at this point polymers uh, enzymes are polymers with 200 to 500 amino acid monomers. The typical molecular weight is uh, 10,000 to 100,000 Daltons. They have a compact three-dimensional structure, very often are globular in shape, and a typical diameter is 5 to 10 nanometers. Here you can see some examples, two examples of enzyme shapes. Uh, if you look closely, there are some highlighted in the middle of the structure, some colored uh, some colored atoms, and that is the active site where the, chemi where the chemical reaction occurs. But you can see as you look different polypeptide chains and some uh, helical structures as well. These can be drawn in different ways, and I can just give you an example here of the enzyme pepsin. Uh, different colors here represent different atoms, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon, and some sulfur and so on. And here you can see the sort of pocket that's formed in the three-dimensional shape of the enzyme. And that is, in the case of pepsin, is where the reaction occurs. Before we uh, go farther with that, let's just take a look at the comparative sizes. If you're looking at um, many of the things that you see in the wet end of a paper machine, hardwood, softwood, fibers, fines, clay, starch, polymers, etc. If we put it on a linear basis, there's really uh, not, the enzymes aren't even on the radar screen compared to the size of a fiber or fines even. If we change it to a logarithmic uh, x-axis, you can see then once again enzymes are very are much smaller than any of the other things we commonly use in a, a paper making furnish. They're probably we could probably stretch 100,000 of these together and uh, then that would stretch about the length of a hardwood fiber. But that gives you an idea of the comparative structures that we're dealing with, uh, the comparative sizes we're dealing with these structures. And a couple of terms might be useful. The molecule in which the enzyme act is, acts is called the substrate. And then there's an active site, another thing, the term we've used. This is a location of the enzyme where the reaction actually occurs usually made up of one to three amino acids in a very specific spatial configuration. These three amino acids, one to three, these they are not sequential. They're just on different parts of the chain and they come together at a certain point to facilitate the reaction that's going to occur. And we can show that reaction here. The substrate is shown as a blue molecule and the red molecule, the enzyme as the gray structure on the bottom. So the reactants are typically uh, termed the substrate and the active site on the enzyme is just shown by the pockets here. And here's the reaction that occurs. The two things are drawn to the active site. At that point the chemical reaction occurs and there you have your chemical change and then the product is released and the enzyme is regenerated, unchanged, uh, to, f to catalyze or facilitate another reaction uh, when two more molecules of substrate come along. So we have the definition of a catalyst. It's not used up in the reaction. The enzyme facilitated the reaction, but it was regenerated at the end 
and we have the disappearance of the substrate and the production of the products. Now enzymes don't necessarily just put together things but they break down things as well and that would be shown in this diagram as this molecule comes to the enzyme, attaches to the active site and a piece is removed and then the rest of the substrate is released and so you have two separate products here and once again the enzyme has been regenerated at the end of the reaction. An example already given was pepsin, that's a digestive enzyme that uh, degrades food proteins in the stomach. A uh, common name for this class of enzymes would be a protease, something that breaks down proteins. You'll see more of that nomenclature in the discussion that comes after. Pepsin in the human stomach, there's the active site and then the reaction that occurs here you can see protein then has an affinity for that site. When it's bound to the active site then uh, there are bonds that are strained in a certain way that uh, the protein then is broken down to smaller pieces than other enzymes in the body and reduce that finally to the final uh, product that can be utilized in metabolism. Here's another example of an enzyme uh, that be, being catalase. Catalase catalyzes decomposition of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. Now in the paper industry if you're bleaching or attempting to bleach recycled fiber that can be a serious problem. You want your hydrogen peroxide to react with the colored materials in the, in the recycled fiber and not just to degenerate to oxygen. But in living things it's important because catalase is produced as a byproduct of metabolism for all aerobic organisms but catalase is a can be is a toxic material really and so you need material in your cells to uh, eliminate ox I mean peroxide and this is exactly what catalase does it does it very efficiently this is the reason peroxide foams when you pour it onto a cut because the blood and the cells other cells uh, contain catalase so it, in fact it's good for you because it reduces damage to living cells it acts as an antioxidant and uh, one thing that's interesting is that one molecule of catalase can reduce 40 million molecules of hydrogen peroxide in a second. So you can see how efficient um, these, these biochemical catalysts are. Um, 40 million molecules per second are reduced by one molecule of catalase. And in uh, proper conditions, that enzyme, that catalase, en catalase enzyme can have a half-life of 20 hours or more. So you, you can see why this is a problem when you're trying to add uh, peroxide into a system and catalase is there. Another example in, from the human body is an enzyme carbonic anhydrase found in blood cells where it catalyzes the reaction that you see there which involves the removal of carbon dioxide from your cells. Uh, enables the transport of carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs. One molecule of carbonic anhydrase also works very quickly, not as quickly as catalase. It, it can process one million molecules of carbon dioxide per second. So you get an idea that there's an incredible variety of enzymes. They perform many different sorts of functions. They function at incredible speeds and each enzyme is very specific. It's built to affect only a certain type of reaction, maybe only on one substrate, although that'll vary. But uh, we'll talk about later how we can utilize that sort of functioning in the paper industry. There are many different classes of enzymes. A hydrolase has, adds water across a bond, and that's a lot of the products that we'll be dealing with in the paper industry are hydrolases. A ligase forms bond, a lyase cleaves bonds, an oxidoreductase would be more like a catalase molecule involving the transfer of electrons, and isomerase affects a structural change in a molecule. In the paper industry, lipases have been available for 25 years to uh, be used for pitch control, and amylase has been used for many years uh, for enzyme conversion of starch. A cellulase, uh, more interest in recent years, cleaves bonds in cellulose molecules. Protease, as we discussed, breaks down protein, and a xylanase will act on 
certain types of hemicelluloses that are in the uh, fiber. I will talk just a little bit about a potential problem. In the earlier discussion, you may have noticed that one molecule of catalase reduces 40 million molecules a second. One molecule of carbonic anhydrase affected uh, one million molecules per second of reaction. Um, so how do you evaluate the strength of an enzyme product? What's equivalent to percent active? So for example, if you had a product that contained one percent of an enzyme that worked very fast, and a product contained 40 percent active that worked very slowly, you can see percent active doesn't mean a whole lot when you're dealing with enzymes. So which one of those would you buy? Well, it's not as simple as that. Enzyme activity is determined by me measuring the conversion of substrate to product under controlled conditions in, conditions in a laboratory. For example, if we compare two lipase enzymes, we'll react it with a triglyceride under controlled conditions. So then we'll measure the production of carboxylic acid, or we could measure, if it were easier, the disappearance of the triglyceride. But in every case with an enzyme, enzyme activity, we're dealing with a time-related sort of material. It's going to be units that are so much per second. So one method might be, uh, for lipase might be based on the speed at which the enzyme hydrolyzes a triglyceride called tributyrin, let's say at a pH of 7 and a temperature of 30 degrees C. The, by, the byproduct, the product of the reaction, one of them is butyric acid. And then that's titrated with sodium hydroxide to measure the amount of carboxylic acid produced by the breakdown of that molecule. So one lipase unit would be the amount of enzyme that releases one millimole of carboxylic acid per minute. And then you could have a kilolipase units, unit. So the enzyme's activity in this case is expressing a certain number of kilolipase kilo units per gram of product. The unit is where the uh, function of time comes in. So anyhow, we hear a lot about activity of enzymes. Enzymatic activity is measured in that way. And also enzyme activity is not just the same for a certain enzyme, but it varies with conditions. First of all, it's going to vary with the concentration of substrate molecules. That's just going to determine the uh, number of collisions that you get. So if the if there are more substrate molecules, more reaction is going to occur. It's going to vary with temperature. Uh, each enzyme will have its optimum temperature. Some may be at colder uh, temperatures than others. And uh, each enzyme also will have its optimum pH. And then the chemical environment, if there's a lot of salt around or if there's oxidizers, there's just many things that it can affect an enzyme's activity. Uh, here's an example of an enzyme, in this case, um, it has an optimum activity of right around 40 degrees C. Let's say if we took an uh, enzyme in the human body, all of those would have an optimum, right? Most of those would have an optimum right around 40 degrees C. Now we can get enzymes from uh, nature. For in, example, in this case, a couple of amylases that break down uh, starch. We have a much different temperature optimum in fact, there are amylases that are commercially available that have their optimum right near 100 degrees Celsius. A little unusual for an enzyme to work at that high temperature, but th that does occur. pH is another important thing, and as you can imagine, most enzymes from living things will have a pH maximum, not so much like this one shown, but more uh, like the uh, more at a pH of about seven. And then, of course, pepsin is a, is a special case where it operates best in the acidic conditions in the stomach at a, almost a pH of 2. There are also other chemicals which can reduce or eliminate an enzyme's activity. These are called inhibitors. Uh, there are competitive inhibitors that want to bind to the same site, and so they prevent the substrate from binding there. And then there are non-competitive inhibitors which don't compete with for the active site, but they bind to some other place on the enzyme, affecting its catalytic power. This is a way many of the uh, reactions in the human body are controlled by non-competitive inhibitors. Uh, 
there's a, just an example, a pictorial example of how a competitive inhibitor might work. You have three different substrates that have affinity for the active enzyme. Now, if the competitive inhibitor goes to that site and stays there, it's impossible for the reaction to occur. Some examples in the real world of enzyme inhibitors are aspirin, which inhibits a, an enzyme that's related to the pain response, and then the uh, herbicide Roundup, which inhibits a specific enzyme that's a, essential for growth in plants and so kills the plant in that, in that way. Uh, in the paper industry, we might have to worry, for example, about oxidizers, and this shows the effect of chlorine dioxide on the, lip on the activity of a lipase. And below about 0.1 ppm chlorine dioxide, there's no problem, but as you go up from there, the activity of the enzyme drops off very quickly. This is probably not an inhibitor, but this is probably the effect of the oxidizer damaging the enzyme to the point where it's not able to catalyze the reaction. In that case, you've denatured the enzyme, and if you, more than likely, if you remove the chlorine or put the enzyme in a condition where there's not the chlorine dioxide around, it probably will not recover its activity because its structure has been damaged by reaction with chlorine dioxide. A little bit of history on the use of enzymes. Enzymes from microorganisms have been used in many different things, uh, in baking, in brewing, cheese making, leather tanning, many other applications since prehistoric times. Um, the word itself means in yeast and is derived from the Greek word, the Greek words meaning in and meaning yeast or leaven, and the enzymatic activity of yeast in bread is uh, in view here. So the word enzyme comes from the Greek meaning in yeast. Uh, the first really industrial, large-scale industrial use in fermentation was done by Nordisk, Novo Nordisk, a, Dan a Danish company in the early 1950s, uh, producing by a fermentation a certain enzyme that was used in textile production. Enzymes are widely used in the production of textiles and many other things at this point. And here are some of those common uses. Um, there are many uses of commercial enzymes in food production. For example, the pr production of high fructose syrup from starch. Household detergents, laundry detergents typically contain enzymes for cleaning clothes, fruit processing, fruit juice uh, production is, uses enzymes, many textile processing applications such as the stone washing of blue jeans are done with enzymes, wine production, animal feed additives, and then a more important one uh, in the United States more recently, fuel ethanol production uses uh, enzymes. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the industrial production of enzymes. Um, how do we produce large amounts of these, the lar like the large amounts that are used in textile production or in uh, food production? So what do we need? We need to find an effective enzyme. Uh, we need to have some acceptable economics or nobody's ever going to proceed with it. And then the enzyme must be in a usable form for the, uh, the final customer. It must be easily applied. It must be stable over time. It must be safe and it must be in a certain concentration that is usable and so on. So. Um, Here's then how, the, once one finds an enzyme that is useful, the genetic information that creates that enzyme then is isolated. And somehow we need to produce large amounts of it. So um, this DNA that produces that enzyme, the gene that produces that enzyme is cloned. In this case, what we mean is we take that gene from the, ho from the organism that naturally produces it and we insert it into the genetic information of a host organism. And then host organisms are used that express or produce large amounts of that desired enzyme. We have to have some way to produce large amounts of it. And the biochemists could give more information on how particularly that's done, but this is a very simple way of showing it. Typical host organisms in our bacteria or fungal species that uh, work to produce that will express a large amount of, a, of the enzyme that you've inserted into their genetic information. 
the production of an uh, industrial protein, then we can show on a diagram here. The gene containing that information, the information produced the desired enzyme, is, is cloned, is separated. It's uh, put into, a, it's combined with vector DNA, and what we have in this is an expression plasma, plasmid, that then is inserted into, in this case, we show a fungal organism. Uh, an Aspergillus species is the host. And so the idea then is now that we have inserted into that uh, uh, cell the genetic information and some other uh, information as well to encourage it to produce the enzyme, hopefully it'll produce a large amounts of that enzyme, which then can be separated from the rest of the fermentation broth, and we can collect that secreted protein, that particular enzyme that we're interested in. Then a little bit more about the manufacture of enzymes. That the, when the bacteria, the fungus are grown, it's done in a fermentation. And uh, basically what we have is a growth of that host in, uh, organism on a large scale. And uh, then we have to recover. We have to extract from that fermentation the particular biological material that we are interested in. And we have to purify that and formulate it into a usable product. Enzyme sources are interesting. There are many, there are countless thousands of and millions of enzymes in nature. And from those, from naturally occurring organisms, we can get what's called wild type organisms. And really, what's of special interest these days, because so often in the industrial application, like in pulp and paper, we're interested in th conditions that wouldn't be typical for that an organism lived in. We go to extreme conditions, organisms that thrive in steam vents at the bottom of the ocean, high temperatures and pressures, organisms that grow in a hot spring, and uh, that, that sort of thing. So we can get extreme, or let's say enzymes that will uh, uh, operate in extreme conditions from cloning those organisms. Now we can also take those enzymes and uh, but we can modify those enzymes. An organism that produces an enzyme that works fairly well could be um, exposed to ultraviolet light or radiation, other radiation of some sort that might produce a mutation. And then there's the possibility that the mutated enzyme, the enzyme from the, muta enzyme from the mutated organism might be more effective in the conditions we're looking at. There are a lot of other things that can be done to modify the enzymes that occur in nature. Basically, we're talking about protein engineering. But why would you modify enzymes? The primary reason is to enable activities, as we spoke about, that the enzyme could have activity at conditions that are not common in nature, but are common in industry, high temperature, extreme pH, and so on. And maybe also we can then get an uh, enzyme to work more quickly to increase the activity. Or maybe we can find one that'll work on new substrates. Just take, for example, if we found an enzyme that would break down lignin in a tree very quickly, or we found an enzyme that would break down uh, polyethylene terephthalate in, in the environment very easily, you can see the benefit then um, if you have, you'd have to have a more aggressive enzyme and it could recycle, break down those materials. Why would we formulate enzyme products? The three steps were finding the enzyme, producing it by fermentation, collecting it, and then putting it into useful formulation. Um, there has to be ease of use. For example, in a, in a paper mill, we have to have it at the concentration that's going to be most useful, so we don't have to be pumping in um, you know, 100 liters a minute into the machine, or maybe just uh, one liter a minute. We want the concentration or the activity of the product to be useful. And then, um, yeah, we could also formulate it so that it maybe works better if we formulate it with surfactants, let's say. And then for stability, you know, these enzymes, some are fairly stable in aqueous systems, but a lot of these will uh, break down fairly, fairly quickly in dilute solutions. So if you're going to sell them, let's say, put them in a container and ship from one place to another and sell it to a paper mill, then you need something that maintains its, act its activity over the long time, long term equipment needs that more depending on con con concentration and that sort of thing. And maybe you can think of some other reasons, but it's 
uh, those reasons primarily that we formulate enzymes. Here's an example, uh, just taking a couple of xylanases. If you put them at 50 degrees after two or three weeks, the, the uh, native enzyme has completely lost its activity, whereas if you uh, formulate it properly to make it stable, you can see over, in this case, of maybe six months at 50 degrees, it maintains 90% of its activity. So we don't have to worry about shelf life. Now let's talk about the use of enzymes in the pulp and paper industry. Here are some current uh, uses, commercial uses of enzymes in the paper industry. Microbiological deposit control can be done very easily with uh, enzymes. Stickies control, we'll, talk, we'll give some details in each of these, and pre-bleaching with xylanases is done occasionally. Pitch control is one that can be done. Starch conversion has been done over many years. Drainage, uh, improved drainage on a machine where you want to increase production. De-inking has been done with enzymes as well. Charge control is possible, and there have been a couple of commercial applications. And then fiber modification is one that's very interesting. And uh, the terms we might use, we already probably have used proteases, are what's used for biofilm cleaning to remove slime. Amylases work on starch. Esterases are used for stickies control. Lipases have been used for many years for pitch control. Cellulases are the sort of products we're likely use for fiber modification. Xylanases are what's used in, to improve bleaching. Pectinases are the react with pectin, another molecule in uh, the cellulose fiber, and they can reduce uh, anionic charge in a paper machine. So let's look at these one at a time. Microbiological deposit control, first of all. Uh, of course, if you work on a paper machine, you've often seen this sort of thing, the buildup of biofilm on a surface caused by the growth of bacteria or fungi. And sometimes this, in, the case, in this case, fungi can produce uh, a very tenacious, large deposit on a paper machine. Now, if we looked at that biofilm from the first slide, the earlier picture, under a scanning electron microscope, we can see this is what it would look like. Now, you see these little uh, structures, some of them up top the slime, some of them buried underneath, the cigar-shaped structures are uh, a certain species of bacteria. And the matrix that they have produced for themselves is basically the slime. And so this is a picture of slime with the bacteria that produce it. This would be in a fairly clean system. But in a normal system, of course, fiber and filler and fines would stick to this. And so the primary problem with slime is not the presence of Microorganisms, more microorganisms in the system, that's no problem. The problem is the excretions that they produce, what we commonly call, is, call slime. So there's a bacterium and there's another, and there's several of them throughout this picture. But take another look, there's these small little hair-like structures that are probably involved in the, the earliest um, attachment of bacteria to the to the surface. The slime itself is not made of protein, but these structures are that, that allow the bacteria to stay, stick onto the surface initially. So slime contains some proteins, and the initial attachment is with that protein-based material. So proteases are what we use to disperse biofilm, and there are a lot of mill applications of this worldwide, especially in places like Europe, where the uh, use of the traditional microbicides is being outlawed, maybe for no real reason other than people don't want to um, allow the use of as many chemicals as they have in the past. But so proteases are not the sole solution, they never will be the sole solution to uh, slime control, but they can, they can um, reduce the use of the typical materials that are more toxic. I'll have a slide towards the end here where you can see the comparison of the toxicity of a protease formula to a typical bactericide or fungicide formulation. So these materials can reduce the use of traditional microbicides and have been used on hundreds of machines 
uh, at least 100 machines worldwide for this sort of use. Let's move on to Sticky's control, a primary interest then in um, recycling. They, everybody knows that Sticky's are a major problem in the production of paper and board from recycled fiber. And the sources, as you well know, are glues and inks and coating binders and pressure sensitive adhesives, etc., etc. We have no lack of sources of these sticky materials. The typical problems they cause are well known to holes and spots in the paper, loss of production when the, there's a break on the machine because of these holes, loss of production when the machine has to be shut down for cleaning so you don't get the spots. The use of solvents required for cleaning is another problem, handling those things. So here we see pictures of some of the problems. Stickies in a dryer felt, stickies in a forger near holes and spots in the paper that's produced. Enzymatic stickies control, the first successful commercial product was released in the last three or four years. And this, this material, this particular enzyme, um, reacts with polyvinyl acetate and related chemistries, which are components of many different stickies. A new enzyme is available that breaks the ester bonds in polyvinyl acetate, ethylene vinyl acetate. So the, the result is the size of stickies is reduced and the tackiness of the stickies is reduced as well. And if you can reduce the tackiness of the stickies, you've pretty much solved most of your problem. Here just a result of a lab test um, where in one case, well, basically we have put polyvinyl acetate into water and it produces a milky solution that you see on the right. And then what we do is we put a paddle into each one of these and agitate and here you see the one with the enzyme, the solution remains uh, cloudy and so the organic material, the vinyl acetate polymer that you put into this water remains dispersed, whereas in the one that's not treated, it, it has settled to the bottom or a lot of it is deposited on the paddle. And so with the enzyme, we reduce the tackiness and the tendency of that material to agglomerate. Here's uh, pictures of stickies that are treated and untreated. On the untreated side, you see the typical convoluted surface of a sticky. And once the enzyme is act on it, acted on it, the surface becomes much more smooth, so it's not as likely to be uh, to stick to a machine surface or stick to another one. You just don't have as much surface energy there. This uh, diagram here just shows one of the first trials with this material. It was done in a, a tissue, a machine producing tissue that uh, used a lot of recycled fiber, and the lighter purple on the left in each case is prior to the trial. The red uh, bar is from during the trial and then the green, the darker bar is after the trial. And as we go from, from left to right here, we're looking at, at going through the system, the primary coarse screen, the primary uh, fine screen feed and uh, screen accepts and, and uh, so on into the, then there's the uh, de-ink feed and accepts and so on. But you can see that during the trial there's a, a fr fraction of the amount of stickies present in the furnish. Basically we do this with a test that uh, measures stickies based on their, how sticky they are. It's a transfer from a hand sheet onto a clean sheet of fiber and then it's counted in a image analyzer. And so we can see that before the trial, during the trial, and after trial, there's a huge difference. Mixed office waste furnish. Here's another example, this being old corrugated containers. This is a machine in Brazil producing liner board from 100% OCC. Here the pro stickies were a serious problem, causing breaks in the dryer section and maybe more serious breaks when the, the product was sent to the customer and breaks in their converting operation. They also have the opportunity to reduce furnish cost to use a, a cheaper furnish if it wasn't for the fact that that kind of furnish produced a lot of stickies and so increased breaks in converting hand in the dryer. So the enzyme was active the stock chest. In this case, there was a several hours of re retention time for the enzyme 
to work on the stickies. The results was improved quality. Brakes were almost eliminated. They reduced by a total of 30 brakes a month on this machine, which made about 200 tons per day of liner board from OCC. The stickies in the dryer were reduced. They'd eliminated complaints from their customers. They were able to produce at record rates since they didn't have to shut down for cleaning or due to breaks. I have a couple of pictures here. Before enzyme treatment, this is what a doctor blade in the dryer section would look like. And after uh, the enzyme was added, you can see we still have a very few stickies coming through, but it's a huge difference. And you can see why they had such an increase in production and quality. This uh, enzymatic stickies control was recognized by the US EPA in, 19, in 2004 by a presentation of the Presidential Green Chemistry Award. Pulpery bleaching, really not of interest in recycled fiber, but we'll talk about it anyhow since it's a use of enzymes in the paper and the string during craft cooking. Xylan, which is a hemicellulose, is solubilized and then partially redeposited within the fiber secondary walls. Linkages occur between the xylan and residual lignin, so you get a much poorer bleaching response. So you can get a reduction of, of the brightness from your bleach plant, and you can also get uh, increase in the use of uh, bleach chemistry, so that increases the cost. Xylanase is a highly specific protein catalyst that specifically hydrolyzes those xylans, don't damage the cellulose, and so you get a better bleach response. I'm not going to spend a lot of time other than to show that typically these all lose their activity at a pH of about 9 or 10. And so at the pH of a typical craft plant, they will not work. You have to adjust the pH in order to use these on the brown stock. How about pitch control with enzymes? <clears throat> pitch chemistry is well known. Triglycerides and fatty acids and in a soft wood, you have resin acids, and then there are other things in there, waxes and high, higher alcohols and a number of minor components. The problematic material tends, to, in most cases, to be triglycerides. It's a higher molecular weight, very insoluble material, very insoluble in water, and it tends to be a sticky material. So if you had something that could eliminate triglycerides, then you'd be, it'd be very valuable. Well, in a craft system, of course, the triglycerides are largely broken down to the glycerol and separate fatty acids by the high pH and the severe conditions in the craft digester. But in sulfide or in mechanical pulps, those things are not broken down. So here's the, how what an enzyme would do. A lipase enzyme has been available since maybe 1980 for this sort of uh, action. There is this chemical structure of the typical triglyceride in uh, the tree. So if we add the lipase, basically it breaks these ester bonds at those three points in which it produces a molecule of glycerol, which is innocuous material. And then you also produce three molecules of fatty acid, which, well, in, the, in a craft mill, they can sell as tall L fatty acid. But these things are also much less problematic in a newsprint machine or something else using mechanical pulps. So you reduced your problem because you don't have the triglycerides. You have the fatty acids instead. You maybe haven't eliminated your problems, but there are better ways to treat the fatty acids and remove them from the system, for example, with cationic low molecular weight polymers. Here's a picture of what actually happens, the structure of a lipase. And then in green, uh, attached to it at this, at this time is the triglyceride, with the three chains coming off uh, the glycerol molecule. And that's where then the hydrolysis occurs, and that uh, triglyceride is broken down. What are the benefits? Well, fewer pitch problems. And, and that'll give you better product quality and improved production. You won't have a lot of contamination in the press felts. And in some cases, you see improved strength properties on mechanical pulps, maybe because there's not so much pitch on the refiner plates and so on. Maybe in some cases you'll get an improved coefficient of friction as well, since pitch in the sheet can affect the coefficient of friction. Some lab data from both Birch and Aspen. Originally, you have a high level of triglyceride you treat with the enzyme and it drops off and you can also follow 
the activity of that enzyme by the increase in fatty acids produced by the hydrolysis of the triglyceride. Enzymes also are attractive for cleaning uh, for several reasons. If you can use an enzyme for a boil out in place of strong alkalis or acids, uh, basically there's a, it's much safer, safer for the workers. You're not using uh, dangerous chemistries of sodium hydroxide in the acids. And at the same time, then work can be done on or around the machine during the boil out. You don't have to rope off the machine. There's less chance for upset in the waste treatment plant, too, since you don't have the huge swings in pH. Here's an example. This picture shows a starch system before cleaning. They've typically been cleaned with caustic and uh, heat. And as a matter of fact, in the case, if you use a, a proper enzyme, you can get a very clean system uh, using just enzyme and heat, no caustic. And the fact that you're using a, a safer material also you get improved results from it. So maybe the best way for cleaning is to start with an enzyme for cleaning of a starch system. And then if the deposits on the paper machine have a major starch component, they could, this same enzyme could be used for a boil out on the paper machine. Back to recycled fiber, enzymes have been used for de-inking. Of course, the potential benefits are the sort of benefits you get from effective de-inking, reduced dirt count, and improved brightness. Different enzymes have been used, and so there are different mechanisms. Maybe a cellulase is used in eclipse of fibrils from the ink particles, changing their, their effective density and improving the separation of fiber and ink in the flotation operation. Some inks use uh, soy-based carriers, and so lipase may hydrolyze those inks and break down the inks and improve separation that way as well. And an amylase may improve separation of inks from coatings if the paper that you're recycling has a starch-based coating on it. Here's an example, of course, with the inking. You, do, you uh, graph your brightness, or in this case, your effective residual ink concentration versus your yield. So uh, if at the same yield we get a lower number here, and that is the one with, that is a case where enzymes been added to the surfactant, and the top line only surfactant is used in the lower line an enzyme is used with it, small amount of enzyme. And you can see at the same yield, let's say at 8%, you have a error concentration below 300, where without the enzyme, you're up at a concentration of about 400 ppm for, for eric. Enzymes for drainage have been used off and on. I think there's a lot more we need to learn about that. The typical enzyme used is a cellulase. The benefits, if it works properly, are increased production, and you could reduce the hex bo head box consistency, get better formation, and that sort of thing. The idea there is that you're hydrolyzing fines or you're hydrolyzing fibrils, and so the water uh, drains away from the fiber more easily than it, than it might without um, the action of the enzyme. And here's some laboratory data that as we go from the top where there's just the control and we add small amounts of enzyme, we get an improvement in drainage. And then when we start, when we continue to increase the enzyme, basically it levels off or we get a little bit of a back uh, loss of drainage again. More, more discussion about that in a minute when we talk about cellulases and fibers. Enzymes for charge control. Well, we know that controlling colloidal charge is a crucial part of maintaining balanced wet end chemistry. Following var variables, for example, are very dependent on the consistent control of colloidal charge. Drainage, retention, formation, efficient use of sizing of wet strength and of dry strength additives. A lot of anionic trash in the system will make the use of those materials uh, much less efficient. Certain enzymes may be effective in reducing some of the colloidal materials that add significantly to anionic charge. And the ones we are familiar with are pectins, which are, uh, are pectinases, which react with the pectins, which are large polysaccharide molecules that are found in the primary cell walls and in the middle lamella of the fiber. Pectinase has been used in a couple of mills to effectively reduce the colloidal charge. Enzymes for fiber modification is, uh, has a potential for being uh, 
great help to the production of paper. Let's just talk about fibers. Wood fiber is made primarily of cellulose, but it also has a, well, a number of other materials, including hemicellulose, as we've discussed a couple times here, the lignin that holds it all together, and a small level of extractives that produces the pitch that we spoke about. Enzymes exist in nature to recycle all of these components. And so if we could find those enzymes and apply them effectively, we could certainly have some interesting results on the fiber. What if you could use an enzyme and increase sheet properties, burst or tensile or ring crush? Prop what if you could improve interfiber bonding by the action of an enzyme? What if you could increase drainage? We spoke about that. What if you could reduce the energy used in refining, especially in a mill like a th producing thermomechanical pulp? Huge amounts of energy are used. What if we could reduce fines uh, in different parts of the system? What if we could change the fiber properties and change the sheet properties? Well, a lot of these are, are possible, and let me give you some examples. But before we do, let me just say there's a potential problem here with certain, if, if you have a cellulase, the whole function of a cellulase in nature is to degrade cellulose. So if you had certain cellulase enzymes in a long contact time, you could cause significant degradation of the fiber. In fact, in the industry, there have been a couple of cases where problems have occurred when cellulases have been used without proper knowledge and prior study. Here's an example. Now, before I show you the next picture, let me just say we're talking about a very large level of enzymes, so this wouldn't happen very quickly. But here we take some softwood pulp, some bleached softwood from the southeastern United States, and we put in a certain blend of enzymes for a bit of very high level, a level that you could never use economically. After four hours contact time, you can see we've uh, degraded the uh, characteristics of that fiber pretty badly and you have trouble producing any kind of sheet of paper from it. But now if we take that same fiber and a different cellulase, even a longer contact time, even yet with large uh, dosages of enzyme, you can see basically if you look closely, you can see some effect of the enzyme, but the fibers have remained intact. So it's important to know how a particular enzyme reacts with a particular fiber if you're going to utilize these. I'll just show you a series of slides from data when we've treated bleached softwood fiber with several different enzymes. In this case, the dashed line is the control, and on the x-axis is 0 to 500 to 1,000 revolutions on a PFI mill. So we're, finding the fi we're refining the fiber. And now we're not doing heavy refining, we're just doing a maximum in that case of a thousand R revolutions. Some enzymes will increase the Canadian standard freeness very quickly and others don't have much of an effect at all. Let's take a look at the tensile index. The same x-axis, 0, 500, and a thousand revolutions. Same, number, same enzymes, they have a different effect. But notice that at the level of, at the end of that arrow, 250 revolutions, we've reached the same tensile in the sheet as the control has after 500 revolutions. So in that case, there's a possible reduction of 50% in the amount of refining to get the same tensile characteristics with three different enzymes there. Well, how would it affect tear? Well, you see, once again, there are large differences from one fiber to the next. Once again, refining, controls refined 1,000 revolutions, and at the midpoint, 500 revolutions. In some cases, the tear has been increased, but in one case, the tear has been reduced. So there, in that case, we have an enzyme that improves tensile and reduces tear, which may be of interest in some mills and may be a problem in others. But uh, you can see that there are different effects from different enzymes. How do we explain this? Well from one fiber to the other, the chemistry is different, different hemicellulases, celluloses, uh, and then different enzyme blends have much different activities depending on what gene has been used to produce those cellulases. And they're, ne they're seldom pure materials, they often have different kinds of activity in there. And then what we haven't spoken about is that a cellulase might be an exocellulase that begins to break down the, st the cellulose molecule from the end, 
or it may be an endocellulase that cuts the cellulose in the middle of the molecule. And you can speculate which is what sort of effects one would have and what the other would have, but you can know for sure that those are going to act differently. And enzymes, different cellulase enzymes have different active sites and they have binding domains in some cases that attach into the fiber. Others don't have binding domains. So um, when you say cellulase, you're talking about many different kinds of enzymes and they should be studied carefully before you move on, before you go ahead and put them in a paper machine and that's what we've done and you can see some of the different characteristics that we found. Um, let me just give you an example, a recent example of a trial. This mill loca is located in North America and producing napkin grades. They're using recycled fiber. They prefer not to use virgin craft but the problem is they have difficulty meeting strength requirements even if they have 33 percent craft added to their recycled fiber and the craft is added only to improve the strength of the sheet. So the solution in this case after careful study was the addition of an enzyme. In this case like I say it depends on the activity of the enzyme but about one kilogram per ton of enzyme was used and what were the results? Well there were no problem meeting the target specifications for that sheet even though craft was completely eliminated. With 33 percent craft sometimes often it was difficult to meet the dry strength specifications. In this case the enzyme has affected the fiber in such a way that you get much better interfiber bonding. In fact we also get an increase in drainage and a reduction in the refining energy too. So once you carefully study which, which enzyme to use, you can get excellent results from it. Let's move on to a slightly different topic here. Um, why would we use enzymes anyhow? I think you can already see that one reason is that you get unusual results. It'd be difficult from mechani in mechanical ways to, well, other than adding, in that last case, other than adding uh, some virgin pulp into the system, even then the long fiber didn't produce the strength they needed. But one thing is enzyme will give you unusual results. But let's back up here and talk about worth, worker health and safety. We're talking about proteins that have been used in the industry for over 50 years now with very few problems, uh, health problems. So it's a, it's a safe material to use. What are, what are enzymes produced from? Uh, they're produced from readily uh, renewable resources. You can find the bacteria, you can feed the bacteria readily available materials. There's no petroleum-based materials involved and so uh, for environmental reasons uh, enzymes are, are attractive. After the hurricanes that went through the Gulf Coast recently there was a big uh, problem with supply of petroleum-based raw materials. Well enzymes have no petroleum-based raw materials involved and there's very little energy required to produce them. So there's a lot of environmental reasons that, that enzymes are attractive. Now while I'm saying that I want to also uh, uh, add that for example for the control of stickies this enzyme that was described earlier works well for polyvinyl acetate or vinyl acetate based polymers that are used as adhesives but it doesn't work at all on styrene butadiene for example. So just because enzymes are available doesn't mean the conventional uh, chemistries can be eliminated. Uh, in most cases there's, there's no way to eliminate them. But we can reduce their use, be less re re and rely less on uh, non-renewable resources if we can use enzymes for a lot of these uses. Uh, like I discussed, these enzymes are more effective than anything else in some of the applications that we've discussed and they give unique uh, effects. And the effects are targeted. When we put an enzyme in for stickies control, we don't have a problem with that degrading the fiber or changing the color of the sheet or affecting retention. We use small amounts. They don't affect anything else. They're targeted effects, which is another big uh, advantage. And I've talked about why, uh, about the, the renewable resources being another advantage. And then 
Green chemistry is something people like to hear these days, so enzymes are green chemistry. More information on safety, as we've said at the beginning of the talk, enzymes are widely used in the food industry, production of juices and wine, and for example, chocolate-covered cherries. They're used in many household detergents, other cleaning pro products with, uh, which are safe. The only known possible health effect is that some enzy enzymes are allergens if they are inhaled. Uh, some people may be affected by some proteins, but so care is taken to minimize contact with dust from a solid enzyme, and all the product, enzyme products that we produce, we produce as liquids, more easily handled anyhow in the paper industry. Let me just give you an example of comparing aquatic toxicity. I mentioned that some enzymes are used for slime control. We compare the aquatic toxicity, you can see an example, but let me just say once again that uh, for preservation, enzymes don't preserve things. You have to have some kind of material that's toxic to bacteria or fungi. And, but here's an example, microbicide A, the EC50 for Daphne, that means the effective concentration that kills 50% of these in 48 hours is a fraction of a part per million. And we have in my microbicide B, which is an aqueous material that has a low amount of active, but its EC50 is a fraction of a part per million as well. We take the protease formula, and basically Daphne can swim in it, and if you're talking about 32 parts per million, we're talking about 3% active of the protease formula. So the aquatic toxicity is attractive if, in fact, it's, you have a situation like biofilm on the wet end of a paper machine where you could use the protease. In Europe especially, uh, ecotox is a, something that's measured and involves doing the aquatic toxicity of BOD-COD ratio and the effect of a chemical on the respiration rate in sludge. In the case of a certain enzyme that we're using here, you can see the LC50, the lethal, lethal concentration that kills 50% of the zebra uh, fish, Daniel uh, Rerio, is about 700 milligrams per liter. That's in the, definitely in the very slightly toxic range. The BOD to COD ratio is 0.66. That means most of the COD can be biodegraded, so it's rated easily biodegradable. And then the activated sludge, it, since it has protein in it, it actually increased the respiration in the system by 13%. So it's a positive result, not a no negative result at all. We've done some skin patch testing where enzyme formulas applied to human skin. No negative results have been seen. How about the future for enzymes? This, as you can see now, this area is very promising for new technology. Countless natural enzymes are available, including many from extreme environments that will work in extreme conditions. And then natural enzymes can be modified to produce enzymes that work at more extreme, extreme conditions and work uh, more efficiently as well. So maybe you could use your imagination and think what could enzymes do for the pulp and paper industry. No doubt we're just scratching the surface of what we could do. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, enzymes I think we'll see in the, in the very near future are going to be valuable for many different sorts of things. Let me say thank you to uh, my employer Buckman Laboratories and also to Novozymes, producer of of enzymes, which uh, I've used some of their, a few of their diagrams in this uh, presentation as well. If, if you have any questions after you've seen this, pass those on to Dr. Venditti, and he can also get, let you know how to get in touch with me or with a Buckman representative in your area, and they can, we can uh, see if we can help you on the production of these sorts of things. Thank you very much.